Merry Christmas, everyone. Have you been listening to carols? A famous traditional Christmas carol has these words. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Tis the season to be jolly. Well, we didn't have a very jolly Christmas last year, and it seems that the pandemic has stolen the joy this Christmas as well. Maybe, for you, it doesn't even seem like Christmas at all. But why? In fact, what is Christmas really about? Is it really just a time of year for putting aside the stress and the worries of daily life and having magical thoughts of Santa Claus bringing gifts? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to please bless these words, anoint them with your spirit, and turn them into words of life. And I pray whoever hears these words, wherever and whenever they are heard, that they will be words of life. They will be a message from you to the person who hears them. And they will hear you speaking and they will know your message to them. And I ask this blessing in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What we are remembering at Christmas is the day that the Messiah came to rescue us from hell. We are reminding ourselves of the day when the prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled. It's time of year to have hope because God always keeps his word. Also, at Christmas, we are reminding of us, ourselves of who Jesus was and who Jesus is today. Jesus said, Matthew 11, 11, that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets. Jesus also said that he was greater than John and that the Old Testament scripture was pointing to him. Jesus says to the Jewish leaders in John 5.39, the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Jesus tells them that Moses will accuse them in front of God for their unbelief. Jesus says that, if they really believed in Moses, then they'd also believe in him, because Moses wrote about him. Speaking to certain disciples after his resurrection, Jesus made the same point. He said in Luke 24 that they were being slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken about him. When the Messiah was born on that first Christmas, it wasn't a surprising thing that nobody could have expected. The birth of the Messiah was the fulfillment of a promise made by God many, many years before and repeated over and over by his prophets. This means that the whole of the Old Testament is about Jesus. And we cannot understand the Old Testament without understanding Jesus. Jesus gives us the meaning of the Old Testament. Pastor John Piper says, The flood and the ark, the Passover and the Red Sea, the wilderness and the promised land, exile and return, war and peace, kingdom and kings, prophets and priests, the temple, its sacrifices and its rituals, wisdom in death and life, songs of lament and rejoicing, the lives of faithful sufferers and the blood of righteous martyrs. The Old Testament is extraordinarily Jesus-shaped. More than this, Jesus is actually present in the Old Testament. Look at these verses. 
the I am, in whom Abraham rejoiced with Jesus. John chapter 8, verses 56 to 58. The Lord who motivated Moses was Christ. Hebrews 11, 26. The Redeemer who brought them out of Egypt was Jesus. Jude chapter 5. The rock in the wilderness was Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. The king of Isaiah's temple vision was the sun. John chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. Now let's go all the way back to Genesis and to the fall of man and see Jesus there. Picture how Adam and Eve, ashamed at their sin, hid among the trees. They tried to control or manage their sin. And they did this by covering themselves in fig leaves in an attempt to hide their badness and to project a false goodness. But their Lord had a different solution. He covered them with skins. We're not told what innocent creature died clothe the guilty pair. Isaiah and Paul both notice this and apply it to us. Our Lord clothes us, the guilty, in alien righteousness, in the skin of Jesus, the Messiah, you could say. Look it up. It's in Isaiah 61.10 and Galatians 3.27. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the woman Eve isn't cursed for her sins. The ground was cursed, but not Eve. God said her seed will defeat Satan at great personal cost. The NLT translation says her offspring, but the Hebrew word is seed. Of course, you know, a woman doesn't have seed. This refers to the miraculous virgin birth that we celebrate at Christmas, the arrival of the one promised in Genesis, promised already just after the fall, who will defeat evil and return us to the garden. The concept that Jesus came to teach humans on planet Earth to be nicer and kinder and more loving toward each other sounds good. 21st century ears. But it makes Jesus out to be someone he was not. The central message of Jesus the Messiah is the blistering, high voltage, extremely subversive, earth shaking gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The gospel is a radical call for us to forsake the present world system, its values its ways, its philosophy, its language, the style of speech, its pleasures, and even one's own life. When Jesus was born, the people of Israel were waiting for him. The leaders and the shepherds, the common people and the teachers of the law were all eagerly anticipating his arrival. They knew the promise of the Old Testament. But when Jesus was born, nobody except for a few shepherds could recognize him. King Herod tried to kill him. When the Messiah was an adult, they still failed to recognize him. And they did kill him. This Christmas, do we recognize Jesus and come to him? Or do we have a wrong picture of who the Messiah is? The crucifixion of Jesus is in the Old Testament. There it is in the puzzling story in Genesis 22 that the modern reader often wants to reject. God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. 
This son is the seed of Abraham, the hope of the world. All of God's promises are focused on this beloved son. If he is sacrificed, God would somehow have to bring him back to life in order to save and bless the world. This mountain is in the region that became Jerusalem. He carries wood on his back as he trudges up the hill toward the atoning sacrifice. And when we see the pattern, the death and the resurrection of the Son, Genesis 22 becomes not a barrier, but an almighty boost to faith. It is a picture of what is to come in Jesus. It's also a picture of how to follow Jesus, as we are called also to take up our cross. We have given our life to Jesus of Nazareth, this world's true Lord. And he then gives us a new life and clothes us in his skin. And we now live out this kingdom life with, with others who have embraced the gospel of the kingdom. There are vital promises to trace throughout the scriptures from Genesis 3 onward. Jesus is the seed, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. Jesus fulfills each promise of land, peace, blessing, and so on. And this is all true, but it's not all of the truth. In addition to these perspectives, we should also see the Son of God as present in the Hebrew Bible. This is vital. There is no conflict between the two covenants. What straddles the old and new is not simply a plan or a promise. It's a person. Jesus unites the Bible. As it was prophesied in Genesis 49.10, Jesus was a descendant of Judah through Joseph, as stated in Luke 3. As it was prophesied in Micah 5.2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. As it was prophesied in Isaiah 7.14, Jesus was born of a virgin. As it was prophesied in Jeremiah 31.15, a cry is heard in Ramah, deep anguish, and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for her children are gone. Matthew 2 tells us King Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old and under. Based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance, Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. Jesus, who we celebrate on Christmas Day, is the one spoken of in Isaiah 22, 22. I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. When he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. He is the one spoken of in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. The one who was promised came to us at Christmas as a baby. The God who made these promises also promises to save us and promises that Jesus will come again to establish his rule over the whole earth, ending for all time the wickedness that brings suffering and misery. Remember that this Christmas. Remember that God has not finished what he started. God will not rest until we are all living in his kingdom as his children. Jesus has defeated the evil one who brought destruction, and we are being set free 
from his power. Christmas is a time of hope, but not a time for romantic pictures that offer empty promises. Jesus' teaching about love is given to those who have already submitted to his absolute lordship and who became part of his kingdom. Love, the way Jesus defined it, which isn't the same way the world understands it, and lived it, is how the kingdom of God operates. Love, like the love of Jesus, always requires losing your life, laying it down, denying self. However, we cannot love in the biblical sense unless we first forsake all, repent, and trust our lives to Jesus, faith, and receive the divine life of Jesus into our being, the new birth. The nature of divine life is love, and you cannot receive this kind of divine love outside of receiving Christ and having his spirit indwell you because of Christmas, because Jesus was born as a man, we can celebrate. So hallelujah, Merry Christmas. Amen.